In this and the next couple of videos, we're going to take a look at one of the more difficult aspects of computational fluid dynamics, and that is dealing with turbulent flows. We're going to look at the three main approaches, that is direct numerical simulation, or DNS, large eddy simulation, or LES, and Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes, or RANS. So in this video, I'll introduce some of the issues that we have because we're looking at turbulent flows, and then we'll look at the DNS approach. The first thing I want to do is convince you that this is the CFDer's worst nightmare. So I'm going to discuss three characteristics of turbulent flows. The first is that they are highly unsteady. There's these seemingly random fluctuations of velocities and pressures that's occur that are occurring in the flow that we need to be able to calculate being able to model. Now I say here seemingly random, and that's because in actuality they're not random. These are deterministic processes, they're not stochastic, but people often talk as if they are random because they do appear to be so. The second characteristic is that they are inherently three-dimensional. So even if your underlying flow is two-dimensional, because of these velocity fluctuations that are gonna occur in all three dimensions, the flow is inherently three-dimensional, no matter what. And finally, there's a wide range of temporal, so time, and spatial scales. So the unsteadiness and the three-dimensionality are both a hit, but not only that, but the temporal scales as well as the spatial scales can be very, very small. And we'll talk more about that and we'll quantify that in this video. So again, this is a CFDer's worst nightmare. However, in practice, most flows actually are turbulent. So this is something we can't really avoid. We're gonna have to hit this head on. And so we'll look at the three approaches to dealing with turbulent flows. So here are the three approaches that we can take. And we'll look at the first one in this video. So these are given an increasing degree of approximation and decreasing computational requirements. So as I go down from one to two to three, we're going to increase the amount of approximation that we're making. And by doing so, we'll end up with a method that's fewer computational requirements. So that's gonna be the trade-off. More accurate, more computational resources necessary, more approximations being made, therefore less accuracy and less computational requirements. So the three approaches are as follows. Direct numerical simulation or DNS, the idea here is that the Navier-Stokes equations that we've been looking at, the 3D unsteady versions, actually account for all of the physics necessary for turbulence. So again, it's not a stochastic process, it's a deterministic process governed by the Navier-Stokes equations. So if we can resolve all of the scales, temporally and spatially, then we will capture turbulence when it does exist in the actual flow but this will require very, very small time steps as well as very fine grids, so small delta x's and delta y's and delta z's. It's the easiest to formulate because we already have the Navier-Stokes equations, nothing more has to be done with them, but it's the hardest to solve because of the extreme computational resources that are required. We'll talk more about that. Then second approach, which requires some approximation but requires less computational resources, is known as the large eddy simulation approach, or LES. So here we're gonna recognize that it's really only the large scale motions that are specific to the geometry, specific to the overall flow environment. All of the small scale turbulence, at least for certain classes of flows, are gonna be relatively similar. So what that suggests is that we can take the small scale features, regardless of the overall geometry and characteristics of the flow, and we're gonna model those. So we'll calculate the larger scales, the large eddies, and then we will model the smaller scales. And we'll talk about LES in the next video. And then finally, we have Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes, or RANS. So here we're gonna solve numerically the time average Navier-Stokes equations. So we're essentially gonna average out all of the small scale turbulent phenomenon, and we're gonna end up with just solving for the mean base flow, and then some quantification of the turbulence. The difficulty here is that in order to model the turbulence, we have the so-called closure problem. We're gonna end up with having fewer equations than we do unknowns. We're gonna have to close the system by devising additional equations in order to have a set of governing equations for all the variables that we can then solve. This is the hardest to formulate because we're gonna be modeling all of the turbulence, but it's the easiest to solve in terms of computational time dramatically fewer computational requirements than the other two. So to summarize, for DNS, there is no turbulence being modeled. It's all being simulated directly, thus direct numerical simulation. LES, some of the turbulence is modeled. 
specifically the small scale turbulence, which is relatively uniform from one flow to the next. And then in RANDs, all of the turbulence is modeled. So we're only calculating the mean flow, the base flow. So no, some, and all turbulence. That's essentially the difference between these three approaches. Okay, so let's talk about the DNS approach, and then we'll talk about the other two in subsequent videos. So the three D density and Navier-Stokes Stokes equations have all the physics necessary to describe all fluid dynamical phenomenon, including turbulence. So all of the scales must now be resolved by faithfully solving the Navier-Stokes equations on itty-bitty little time scales, on itty-bitty little spatial scales. So in order to get an idea of what these scales are, let's introduce some definitions. Epsilon throughout is going to be the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. This L sub cap K, the capital K stands for Kolmogorov, as in the Kolmogorov scale. From a dimensional analysis, you can determine the result that the smallest scale eddies, the Kolmogorov scale, is going to be nu cubed over epsilon to the one fourth. Nu is the viscosity of the fluid. Epsilon, again, is the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. That gives you the order of the size of the smallest eddies that we need to resolve in order to capture turbulence. So as the viscosity goes down, the Kolmogorov scale goes down, and we have to have smaller and smaller grid sizes. And then we'll use capital L to denote the length scales of the large eddies. So that's comparable to the overall domain of the system. That's the largest scales for a particular flow. Then RE sub L, the Reynolds number sub L, will be based on the magnitude of the velocity fluctuations and this overall scale. So it's not the overall Reynolds number, RE, REL, has the same length scale, capital L, but the characteristic velocity is given by the velocity fluctuations. So just as a rule of thumb, REL is about 1% of the overall Reynolds number. Based on these definitions, we can determine an approximation for the number of grid points that we'll need in all three spatial coordinates, X, Y, and Z. So that'll be given by capital N, number of points in each of the three directions. It's determined by the Kolmogorov scale at the smallest sizes that we need to resolve. So the number of points in each direction is directly proportional to the big L over little l sub k. So the, remember the big L is the overall eddy sizes, whereas the L sub k is the Kolmogorov scale, the smallest scale that we need to resolve. That corresponds to an RE sub L to the three quarters. So that gives us an estimate based on the Reynolds number and obviously as the Reynolds number goes up, we'll need more and more points to faithfully resolve the flow. That gives us an estimate for the number of points that we'll need in each direction. Notice these are not equal to's, these are just giving us estimates. So in 3D, where you need n points in all three directions, the total number of grid points then is proportional to Re sub L to the 9 force. That's the third power of Re sub L to the 3 quarters. So that's a lot of points. If you do the math on that, remembering that this is about 1 100th of the overall Reynolds number, and you take 9 fourths power, you'll see that these numbers get really big, really, really fast. As the Reynolds number goes up, the Kolmogorov scale goes down, 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 and we need more and more points in order to faithfully resolve every single one of those scales. And that's what's denoted here. Reynolds number goes up, Kolmogorov scale goes down, and the number of points goes up dramatically. Take a Reynolds number of 10 to the 6, which is typical in aerospace applications, divide that by 100 to get the RE sub L, and then take the 9 fourths power of that, and you'll see how quickly these numbers grow. So currently, DNS is only practical for small to moderate Reynolds numbers. Now I intentionally use relative adjectives here, small and moderate, because over time, as computers get bigger and faster, the definitions of what we mean by small and moderate will change. So what we can do today versus what we could do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, of course has changed. But it's still very much the case, and it will be the case for quite some time, that DNS is only practical for moderate Reynolds number. We're not going to be doing full 3D unsteady turbulent flow simulations around an entire aircraft for quite some time. That's still way off far in the future. All right, so let's make some comments about this. Again, it's only possible for moderate Reynolds numbers in simple geometries. 
back in the 1990s when I was in grad school, we used to make fun of our DNS friends because they were doing basically turbulence in a box. So they'd have a little cube, they'd stir up the flow, and they would see what happens. And it didn't seem very exciting at the time, but they were laying the groundwork for much more involved and much more relevant simulations today. But again, there's a long way to go to doing practical engineering applications using the DNS approach. However, it does have a great deal of value, primarily because it produces very detailed information of the flow. You're not doing any modeling other than basic assumptions like a Newtonian and incompressible, for example. So you're getting all the details of the flow. If there are vertical structures in there, you're going to see them. You're going to be able to see them form, evolve, interact with each other. And that's actually what happens in a lot of turbulent flows. You can use it to get turbulent statistics if you like, because again, you have all that detail in there. You could compare those statistics with experiments. It gives qualitative knowledge of the flow. So again, if there are coherent structures, if there are these vertical structures that appear and evolve, you will see them. They are there in the DNS. It's not getting lost. It's not getting swept under the rug through some turbulence model. And it can be used then to develop turbulence models themselves. So traditionally, we would have used experiments and experimental data to get the turbulence models. We can also use DNS, again, because there's no modeling. So take all that data, and you can turn that into various turbulence models, whether LES or RANS-based models. The spectral method, which we've talked about before very briefly, is very popular for doing DNS. And the reason for that is because it has the spectral or exponential convergence rate, and you get highly accurate solutions for the Navier-Stokes equations. So spectral methods are very popular in the DNS context.